anyone out there in the ether? As I say that with no one here. Got some smooth jazz playing for those who enter. Do not fear, the smooth jazz is here. Ooh, we got some people. It's almost time for me to turn off my smooth jazz. What's going on, everyone? I'm gonna wait a couple minutes for people to roll in. But um, we got a, a very special guest um, with us today. I'm very excited to have a very dear friend of mine uh, who is a lover of rock and roll music, lover of Prince. Um, he is a public artist. He has very dry yet wonderful humor. Uh, he is a filmmaker. And he is just an all around pretty awesome person. And I think he's here right now. So Mark, I will let you in so that, you know, I can stop talking about how wonderful of a human you are. Let's just, uh, let's just give the man a platform to speak for himself. Um, so I'm really excited for our time together. Okay. Just let him in. Oh, there he is. Hello. Hey everybody. Hey. Tori, what's going on? What's going on, my friend? How's how's life going? What's going on in your world? I know you you went on a little walk on the bayou today. How was yeah. that? It was nice. I had to get my um, you know, get out there and breathe that fresh air, that fresh yes. air. You know? Yes. You gotta breathe it in. You gotta just like make sure your chakras are aligned for the day, you know. You know this, man. See, like we already like talking on the right level, you know. All day. All day. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanna I I don't know if you heard my introduction of I did. who you are moving. But I would love for you, I would love to take the microphone away from me. I would love to hand it over to you. I would love for you to just explain a little bit about who you are. Um and for those who don't know about your I Love Third War project, I would love for you to kind of elaborate a little bit on that project. Um, that you're that you've been working on for a while now, and um, just tell tell us a little bit about yourself. So the I Love Third Ward project is basically me expressing how I feel about my neighborhood, um, how I feel about the changes, the rapid changes in the neighborhood. It's kind of like my own personal emotional release, but making it into public art form where people can kind of like engage with it and tell me how they feel about it. That's kind of like the fundamental thing. The other thing is bringing my personality through it. Um, and a lot of it all started at Project Row Houses in 2017, where I was asked to be part of this uh, round of art installations. If anybody didn't understand like the process of Project Row, it's, it was founded in the early 90s. And every six months, it's, it's basically like a row of shotgun houses that were going to be torn down. And then Rick Glow and some other artists, Jesse Lott, um, decided to come together and figure out a way to like, you know, get a grant to buy these houses. So that became Project Row Houses. And every six months they invite like a, row, a round of new artists. So each artist can like transform the space however they see fit based on whatever the theme of that round is. So right. my round was round 49, no 47. And that was 2017. And it was initially because I made a, a short film about gentrification in 2008. It was like a quirky short film. It was actually part and of the HBO. That, is that the HBO short? Like yeah, that's the HBO short. HBO short. Okay, okay, great. 
I've been wanting to reshoot that, you know, because I'm way, you know, I could shoot way better and that sort of thing. I've been trying to get grants for that, but nobody. How listened. did that? How did that happen? Like, I know we're talking about. I have so much to talk about with you. Like, we yeah. might not even get to everything because I have so many questions. But like, the HBO film. I mean, that was like a huge moment because that. I mean, that that was showcased. And, and seen by so many people, and that kind of revolved around African American history, right? And gentrification. Was that in Houston, or or was that like everywhere, just in general, where you just try to do kind of some advocacy and awareness on that front? Or it was, it was actually a comedy, like it was like a satirical comedy, um, and it was kind of interesting. Cause I gotta send you a link. I should have thought thought about that, but. It was a quirky comedy. It was five minutes long and basically like a lot of like really short vignettes about my experience living in Third Ward, like how the properties were going up in value and stuff like that. And at the time, I was I had these exaggerated numbers for that for raggedy houses, right? And that it's you know now I'm looking at that was like prophetic, you know, because everything that I satirically talked about in this video, like, you know, people selling their houses and then like, now they're living out their cars because they have to get this fly car, you know, they went thinking far ahead. Um, wow. You know, houses were 350,000. And, you know, back then it was still like 150 to 200,000 when I made it. Right. And now on my block, they're 350,000. Actually, they're more now. Last year they were 350. Not two years wow. ago, they were 350. So now they're creeping on four, 400 grand. Oh my goodness. And real estate is like a seller's market right now. So it's not, now it's like, it's everybody trying to buy land in like Houston for some reason, all of a sudden, like out of, like people in other countries. So you compete with that, you know, it's, it's intense. And everybody's moving here. It's like, and then, you know, Third Ward is like on the map, like hardcore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and so, I think could you tell us a little bit about the neighborhood that you grew up in? You're talking a little bit about, you know, kind of seeing the property values of these homes in, within your neighborhood. Like, I don't want to get all therapist on you, but, like, how does that make you feel? Like, seeing the that gradual change and, like, such a huge jump of just culture and, like, pushing away the things that you grew up with, that nostalgia, like how, how has that kind of compartmentalized for you? So it's definitely interesting that you had mentioned that because it's, it's definitely like a, a subtle, stressful thing. Like every time yeah. I pass by a, a lot and it's like some old building, I even came up with a term, like sometimes you pass something, you see something got torn down and you're like, wait, what was here? And I call it, yeah. I came up with this word called gentrification. Like, I don't even remember That's what was awful. here before, but I miss it. Like, I don't know why it's not, I don't know what's happening. I've passed this like for decades and I was like, not there no more. Like, what? So, I know this was a fact when, um, you know, when Frenchies got torn down and other places got torn down, and you don't even know what was there before. And, like, it's like if you're around when Astro World was around, or like at least like totally aware when Astro World was around and you still go down 610 and you still see that empty lot and you and always you, like, think about it. And you like in your head with an imaginary yeah. little blueprint still there, yeah. So it's like that, yeah. but like little small, like but a small scale, but more frequent. Yeah, and like over time, like you said, there's like a gradual stressor that's just like yeah, it's one thing it's after the other. So what was it like? Could you kind of like break down those times living in that community did you ever think that you know you would be here kind of representing that uh kind of mental effect uh, that it's had on your life through i love third ward and like what was that like growing up um being i'm not have you been a creative your whole life like have you been an artist your whole life what was that like growing up in that neighborhood so I was, I was, I've always been a creative and also like full disclosure, like I moved to Missouri city for a while, but I was always back and forth to third ward. You know, my grandmother picking me up from, from school and stuff like that and, and grandfather. And 
So I remember those days. And then I also worked at TSU for like a long period of time. I graduated from TSU and ended up working there doing graphic design for the whole school. So I was always really around Third Ward. And like even before I physically lived in Third Ward and got a house, you know, I would, I would party here, you know, like come and go to the coffee shops and do, you know, spoken word poetry and stuff. So it was always a time that I would be here. And for the past over 10 years, I've had a house here, like just fix it up over time. I got like a raggedy house and fix it up over time. And I was trying to tell everybody, all the friends I knew that worked in corporate places that had these really great jobs and stuff. Hey, you gotta get a, you gotta buy, you gotta buy a house here. You gotta buy a house here, you know, buy a house here. You know, at least so I can have, you know, friends here. <laughs> yeah. time, I know it was like number old black people. And, yeah. You know, they would die. They may or may not have left it to their kids, and the kids may or may not have just sold it because they understand what it was all about. You know, it's like, right. it's like, you know, so that would happen. That would materialize, and I'd say like my block is maybe over a third white now, and they're paying like the top price. Like if it just goes on sale, they're gonna like, oh, I want that, because you know they have multi generational wealth. It's like, of course, okay. yeah. <laughs> That's I want it. I got it. Let me take that from you. Yeah. <laughs> well, so you you mentioned a little a little bit about the old the old people in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, and I know that you have a project that kind of centers around learning about your el learning about your elders, but also like the historical and generational things that they're passing down before they pass. Was that something that was also inspired by you living in this neighborhood and kind of just like witnessing and seeing and talking and communicating with like the elders in your neighborhood, with maybe the people in your family who maybe grew up in Third Ward as well? Like, tell us a little bit about your elders um, project and like how how has that. I guess, evolved, and what have you learned from your elders and third ward? Okay, so that project is a, is a, a partner with uh, my friend Boosie peters Mon. She's a great person. She has an organization called WOO, which is Women Healing and Empowering Women. So I've always, uh, you know, recording elders and their stories it was kind of like what I was doing. And then Boosie was had the desire to do it. So I had the film gear and she had the desire to do it. And like, I've known Boosie for a pretty long time. So we were friends. And um, so she's like, okay, I'm gonna apply for this grant. It was called, um, yeah. uh, what's the name of that organization? Something Roots. Anyway, so they funded the project. You know, me and Boosie wrote the grant, funded the project project and Boosie actually came with the idea of adding children to the idea because me I'm always thinking in terms of liability and you know <laughs> right. kids and so I was like man right. I want no kids in this <laughs> it's dumb. why you gonna put some kids you interview and that actually ended it's up being a, a brilliant puzzle, idea Mark. it's a part of the puzzle <laughs> yeah and it became a brilliant idea like even while I was shooting it like I was like man why don't they just ask some adult questions you know so it's kind of cool to work with other people because I have, you know, you know, you have one your perspective, and now it's like I just want to shoot with kids. Oh. So it's cool because they add, they add. Um, it depends on the kid because some kids are like just kind of like deadpan in front of the camera and just like, ah, just. <laughs> so you just gotta tell them what to ask, and then there's other, you know, actually Boosie's daughters have all the personality, like you know, Boosie's from New York, so. Okay. dynamic so the kids ended up being like really charming talkative kids so they kind of worked out really well whenever they involved so how it came about was that's that's the story i came with the idea and well i mean i came up with the name of the brand and stuff and you know just because that's what i what i do and um we came up we had some really great interviews and there's a lot of stuff that i just did learn you know, just hearing them talk about how it was before, like, you know, decades ago, and, yeah. you know, that 288 wasn't always there, you know, there used to be yeah. a whole neighborhood over there, and it's kind of how they, they um, do, you know, I don't know if it came about when it was, because for a while, there was Jewish, I can't remember, I keep forgetting what decade it switched over, yeah, oh, there wow. was Jewish, there was sort of the Jewish neighborhood. 
I had no idea. And for for those watching, I am not a great Houston uh, historian. I am originally from New Orleans, Louisiana, so this is new information to me. I had no idea. That's very interesting. Yeah. So of course that evolved and became like you know totally black and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, there's just so much history. It's like it really goes deep. Yeah. So yeah. learning that from the elders and talking about you know their history, like especially uh, it was Dr. Freeman who started the TSU debate team. He was like, yes. Yeah. So yeah. everybody knows about Dr. Freeman. So I'm working on a documentary on him, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, is there is the is this elders project still up and running? Have yeah, guys... it was on pause during the pandemic. Um, okay. But now we, you know, we're going to start back up again. Like we're going to try to like, you know, go ahead and just proceed, you know, without a grant. Because we kind of, we did like eight episodes before. So now oh, okay. we keep going. Because so many people with great stories, you know, and yeah. it just yeah. goes deep, you know, it just goes deep. Yeah. And we're only like two people doing it. And I got to, you know, right. we all yeah, juggling our lives. Yeah. <laughs> we're juggling our lives and stuff like that. And, you know, so. What would you say? Apart from, I mean, it sounds like you got a lot of insight and like things that you probably didn't know about yourself. You learned from from that doing participating in that in that project. Are there any other projects that stand out to you the most that you've been a part of, and why? You talking about in general? Or like... Yeah, just as a whole. Well, definitely the I Love Third Ward project was just kind of morphed. Um, oh, so we kind of switched up, switched over. So, so Project Row Houses was where it started. It initially, they just wanted to show the movie that I did in 2008, which we talked about earlier. But then, you know, it's kind of like at that time I had documentaries that I'd, I'd worked on or was working on, and you know, photography. I was taking pictures of the neighborhood. I was like, hey, I got all this other stuff. I was like, well, primarily want to show the movie. So I kind of obliged that. But me, because my mind is always going, I'm kind of like transform the whole interior of the house and make it look like a Monopoly board. They weren't expecting <laughs> A lot of stuff I did, they weren't expecting. It just kind of like, yeah. I just kind of took the opportunity and ran with it. And like every talent that I had, my sense of, my weird sense of humor, um, my graphic design background, my photography, and basically just kind of following social media and what trends like you know i wanted to put a big i love three w on the outside of the house so mm -hmm. people would come and take pictures in front of it and that would hook people to go inside and then that would get people to check out the rest of the round and that's that manifested exactly like how i envisioned it that's like one of the one of the great times that everything i thought of like was popping and it worked and it, it exceeded my expectations a lot of people's expectations and actually yeah. like a lot of people didn't know about project row houses until i did that there's a lot of people because i interviewed like i did 30 interviews and i actually posted a lot of those interviews on my instagram but a lot of them without fail said i didn't even know this was here wow that is really powerful and i think that um I mean, you know, we, and we've been following each other for quite some time now, and every time I see people, either if it's on your platform or off of your platform, like, interacting with the installation, like, at is it station, station? Right, station. that's the next thing we can talk about. <laughs> yes, let's talk about it. Um, yes. And I see that installation all the time. It's right next to a really beautiful uh, George Floyd mural as yes. well. Uh, can you talk a little, a little bit about how that all came to be? Yeah, so if you're going to, with any type of success, with any type of, if you have any aspirations for anything, it's really great to network with people, even if, like, house parties or whatever, like, your people that you know around you or whatever, because they're going to yeah. find themselves in a different levels, you know? And, and you never know who's that, who that's going to be. I've always been nice to everybody unless they just yep. really just trip all the way out. And even some of them come back around and apologize and be cool again, you know. So, so that came about because people were seeing my work. And one of the guys that works at um, 
works at the station said, hey, we're doing a project, you know, because we can't have a you know, museum open right now because of the pandemic. And we said, we're going to do art on the outside. And want to know if you have any ideas and he would like to put you in there. I was like, okay, cool. So it took me obsessing over a few months of what I was going to do and do a check-in. It was like Alex over there, Al Alex too. And um, you check in and say, hey, so uh, what you got? <laughs> oh, uh, so I said, like all these ideas um, that weren't the Monopoly board. <laughs> and then I just kind of sit, what I did before and say, hey, you know, the Monopoly, you know, we kind of like the Monopoly thing. I was like, oh yeah. I was like, I don't, it, it just hit me. Like, I don't know why. Because I, I wanted to do a big Monopoly board. It's kind of like, I thought the whole thing ran its course. And I was like, okay, people are on other stuff now, you know, they're right, right. Blah, blah, blah. you know, like just really artist foolishness, you know. <laughs> right, right. So I got to laugh at myself with that. So finally, like, I was like, okay, cool. I'm, how about I just update the Monopoly board and we'll like make it big. I was like, okay, that sounds cool. So another three months passed. And I finally updated that, like put all kinds of stuff and I kept coming up with new ideas we could go in there. And um, it came time to uh, figure out where it's going to be. So I was actually going to be all the way at the end um, on like a garage door or something, like, oh, like okay. farther down. Mm -hmm. So I kind of saw like, well, how about over here by the door? You know, like the, by the entrance, so like it'll stop traffic. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, first somebody else was going to be there. I was like, nah, listen, <laughs> this will stop traffic. <laughs> People will pull yes, over. You have to advocate for yourself in your work. You have to. Please. You have to. You have to. Because really, like, my whole, the whole time, like, I haven't really, it's like the whole time I've um, basically been my own hype man. You know, usually you yeah. have a team of people, people like, um, you know, you might be connected or you got like a good, you know, crew or whatever. I'm solo. I've been doing this solo. It was kind of interesting because people would always DM me and say, hey, and refer to me as plural, you know, like, hey, how, you know, and I just let them believe it. Like, like I had a whole team because I did T-shirts, I did, you know, films, I did, I had a like pop up. It was like insane. I look back now, it was like straight up insanity how hard I went because I was like, I have to do, you know, because I, mean, I think like 26. I mean, that's really impressive, too, especially considering, I mean, like, I see your work all over Houston, or I see it on social media in some capacity almost every single week. And right. so, like, could you also, it's, I have so many questions for you, but while you're explaining the Station Museum and how all of this came to be, could you also kind of give people who are watching, especially, like, young Black artists, who like might also don't have a team and they're by themselves and they're making everything happen. Like, how did you manage to do all of this by yourself? And like, where did you get all of this energy from? What motivated you to like be that one man show? A lot of motivation just came from heart, you know, and passion. Like I just wanted to, each year, I don't want to be any. I don't want to do anything at the level I did the previous year. I like. I want to go. Just keep going. Yeah, raise the bar. Yeah. So in my mind, like I was like, because I would I would do pop ups in the brutal sun in July, and it was just like, I question like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? But <laughs> people like, be like, I'd be, store, I'd be in a grocery store. I'd be in a grocery store getting groceries and by myself and shopping. I was like, I don't know why I do that. And then somebody walked up and said, I really want to say thank you for what you're doing. And I was like, really? Because <laughs> you don't know who, who you're reaching, you know? Right. I was like, okay, cool. We keep doing this. Like, this, yeah. it just became obsessive behavior. And it actually worked out. Like, it's gotten me a lot of opportunities uh, applying for grants. Because, mm -hmm. oh, what I would tell people is like, you really just gotta, you gotta dive all the way in. It's yeah. like, no, like, I'm gonna kind of do it. Yeah. I'm gonna see how I feel about it. I'll do a little. Like, the only time anything really popped for me is when I dove all the way in. I made up my mind, this is what I wanna do. Yep. Like, if I say, like, hey, I'm gonna have, have a job to back up, you know, I, for me, like, I can't do nine to fives because I just don't have the brain for it. 
And you know, it's a lot of there's a lot of people out there that are like that. Yeah. You know, but now it's, but these days it's like a great opportunity because we have access to all this cheap technology that didn't exist not too long ago, like apps and promoting yourself and even information like there's a master class for everything there's a youtube video to learn anything you know i was just watching robin roberts master class this morning yeah so good yeah there's a there's, lot of resources out there and there's other people doing it too like there's people like crazy yeah. like young doing it and i just really i eyeball everybody like i wouldn't just eyeball people in my group, I'd see like how other people are moving, you know, like what are they posting on, right. you know, Instagram. And really how I learned how to sell was following the most over the top personalities I could find on Instagram. I followed Kanye, I followed, um, what's the DJ Khalid, who's ridiculous. Oh, yeah, DJ Khalid. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd follow like um, 50 Cent, you know, all this, all this bull, and this one guy locally, he goes by Rich God. He said he's like I makes. Think I, I think I've heard of this person before. Yeah, so he makes clothes, and his clothes are really expensive, and they're for like you know flashy people, people that are like really flashy, and mm -hmm. um, you know they don't mind spending thirty five hundred dollars for a jacket or a shirt, you know. <laughs> but I, I I pay attention to how he would interact with them, and because all I'm doing is selling T-shirts, you know, and, and yeah. buttons at the time. And, so when I would sell it, you know, at my um, pop-ups, I'd be like, um, you know, because I'm pretty much an introvert, you know. So I decided, like, right. if I'm going to sell anything, I can't do, I can't be an introvert. And everybody was just kind of like hitting me up for T-shirts. Right. So I would pretend I was 12 feet tall, and I would say the most over-the-top stuff I could say to sell a shirt, and it would work. Like what? Can you give us an example? <laughs> So here's like let's say you're a woman, you're coming up to my my car, you're looking up, you're looking through the shirts, and and you ask me like, should I get this shirt or should I get this shirt, or should I get this other shirt? Because I can't decide. So I think I'd be on my toes and I'd say, listen, listen carefully. You know, you deserve everything you desire in life. <laughs> Why should you limit your choice? <laughs> to one or two shirts when you can have them all. And people would just be like, okay, you're right. <laughs> and they, I'd bring them up for like three or four shirts and they'd be having them over the shoulder. So they would start seeing that pattern. And I call it the over the shoulder soldiers. <laughs> and you I took a picture that was shirts. You see the hype man like yourself in yeah. their life. <laughs> so it's like, I was totally in my zone for that and it was like great like it's like when it pops it pops and it's like I gotta ride this wave because if I don't you know slow down so <clears throat> I love I'll it. say all kind of stuff and it would work you know and it was kind of interesting because it, it's really you selling an emotion you're selling like a good feeling you're not really selling yeah. it, really I'm just selling ink on a shirt yeah. you know if you want to look at it from a physical perspective but no you saw an idea and it was yeah. one time that I realized how important it is to sell because I was selling my shirts for 30 bucks. And like the cat next to me, he had like all these, you know, black by popular demand shirts and all these kind of like usual type of shirts. And he was unloading his for like 10 bucks because he was trying to like liquidate. And I'm still going at $30 a shirt. <laughs> Look at it. And I was like, you know, it's really about the sales issue. It's really like the philosophy you put behind your product, you know, because you sell right. stuff that everybody else is selling, you know, just being. All things to all people, but me, I have a right. niche. Right. This, <laughs> <laughs> this is special. Like, where else and it's get also that I think the finger wiggling helps yeah. a lot when you're <laughs> selling your products. I think, like, if I saw this, I'd be like, that guy's on to something. Yeah. Um, so I think, like, all of these things are really interesting because it just kind of tells me that a lot of the work that you do alone really pays off. And I think that social media and like word of mouth is like really powerful in this instance. Um, and I was going to ask a question. I see it came through by Caitlin. She asked, how has social media uh, played a role in Mark's work? But not only like, not only has it played a role in your work, but also it's played a role with kind of like 
upping the momentum and the advocacy for gentrification as well. Like, have you seen any, like, trends or any, um, I guess, have you, have you seen your work kind of really impact the Houston community by educating us even mm -hmm. further about gentrification and, like, you know, has social media kind of helped you get that word out and get that message across to, to the community? I'll say definitely yes. And what I can do as far as lack of, I can't really influence policy like that. And I don't have like the capital to like grab the land. So what I do is communicate that this area is important. It's important to preserve an area like, because our brand third ward is like a, cultural epicenter. I'd say that a lot when I was like really kind of pushing it because um, I wanted people to think of it like that instead of like, okay, I'm just going to go, you know, Turkey Lake High yeah. and Bar for Team. I'm going to kick it on Almeida and I'm going to leave. Right. So those right. are the people I want, you know, like following what I do. Absolutely. Because you, know, you can do one way where it's just like, you know, all I care about is like the art world and being in a museum and being an art right. world. I want to do both. Like, I want right. the people, the regular people. I'm really more enamored with the regular people, the people that don't really go to art shows, you know. Yes. Okay, this with the, you know. So, my whole thing is like, and, and I started realizing like people really pay attention to you. Like, um, dude, Chris Senegal who's, does the whole buy the block thing. And, and uh, mm -hmm. like, I didn't know that dude was like really into what I was doing, you know. He was like, yeah. Really and him. And Turkey Lake Hut. The guy Lynn, he bought a piece from me during the pandemic, which I'm very oh, wow. And he was like, um, <clears throat> I noticed on his Instagram, he was he had pictures of my um, Monopoly board art when I had Project when I was in Project Warehouses. So it was like <laughs> definitely I inspire, you know, what I'm doing is, you know, people notice it, you know, whether they like think about it or whatever or ponder it, you know, at least look at this area like a place where it means something. You know, it's not like. Yeah, you know, oh, that's a shame. This is going away. You know, I'm like, now nah, why don't you like record your own elders? Yeah, you know, take pictures, your own pictures. You know, yeah. and like record record the space. You know, absolutely. I realized like I never, you know, library coffee shop. I passed by it a million times and never thought to take a picture of it. it's like so it looks different now, but I never took a picture of that place and I was trying to like yeah. even ask the their Instagram do you have any pictures of the front of this place anybody any pictures of this place and nobody else did either mm -hmm. like nobody took a pictures of Frenchies like I was doing mm -hmm. you know when it was open I was taking all kind of taking, shooting video in there and yeah so it's like a lot of people just kind of take stuff for granted they don't want to think about absolutely it. yeah yeah and we definitely don't understand the gravity or the weight of things until they're gone so yeah. i think that um you know having that preservation is really important and speaking of preservation this could be a nice segue into my next question for you which is like yes there is a huge it, it really sucks to see these communities especially these marginalized communities slowly but surely being completely taken away. Um, but do you, I mean, you know, with the work that you're doing and with the advocacy that you're doing, do you feel a sense of, I don't know, maybe even hope for preserving some of our communities here in Houston? Like, what are your, what are your general thoughts about preservation, current preservation? What is be is there anything being done right now? Is there anything we could be doing to help aid in preserving some at least some of our history here in the community? Definitely, you know, if you want, like, if you're taking pictures of your food when you go to like a restaurant, you know, I'm gonna take a picture. It's cool. Are you taking a picture of you and your homegirls or you and your mm -hmm. boys? You know, just like out partying and stuff. Do that. Right. Have that same energy. For recording the blacks in your area like if it's a historic area just walk around and take pictures you know because yeah. you're gonna be thinking about it you're gonna be thinking about it when it's gone you know case in point there's another place i didn't think to take pictures of it was like this big church by el dorado ballroom across from emancipation park uh -huh. and we got torn down and i never 
I don't know why I just didn't think it'd take a picture of that place. Now it's like gone, gone. It was like a historical marker there. Oh, wow. So I don't know what this stuff like. Obviously, it didn't like help you help the building from staying, you know, staying with us. It was like, right. wow, they put it down. So it's really unfortunate. So that's what I encourage people is like, you know, your grandparents, you know, your parents, like just take out your iPhone and record that stuff, you know, like, because you're going to be trying to relay the message to your, your children and you didn't think to record it, you know, then you're just kind of like going on, you know, spoken word when you could have like, you know, we have all this cheap technology now, you know, to utilize it. I think, you know, maybe that should be my next application, like record your own. Record your name. You heard it here on okay, the Black yeah. Chiefs account first. Okay. Yeah, why why are y'all leaning on me? Why I got to do it? You know? <laughs> I want to focus on a few Bye. things because now I'm going to be scatterbrained all over the place. So I'll focus on <laughs> Frenchies, you know, TSC debate team documentary. Those are solid. And a couple other things I'm not mentioning until they release. And, um, you know, everybody else got to, like, you know, handle up, you know? Yeah, so you heard it. Stop taking pictures of your meals before and after. Start taking pictures of your environment. Of your environment, exactly. Um, <laughs> yes, right, exactly. If this is not a one-man show. This should be a community-wide effort. It really should be. Um, this is really wonderful. Thank you for answering all of my my questions that just keep popping in my head. Um. Oh, I want to know, board, like the Monopoly board is station. I forgot to, we kind of like switch tracks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's try to bring it back. So, yeah, the Monopoly board became very successful when it was, you know, put up as far as like, because everything that happened to happen, like people would stop traffic, people would drive by it, then turn around and park, and then come by and take a picture of it. And, you know, the, the dice in front of it are like, for the chairs, that's the next thing I want to get into is like furniture and chairs, you know, because they're functional. You can sit on them, they're, they're right. chair height. So you can sit on them and look at the board and like see all the little, the little any windows that I have all around the board. Like, you know, Wolf's Pawn Shop that's, that's gone, the owner passed away. So, you know, the family decided they weren't going to keep going with it. So now it's like a fitness gym inside of it. But that's, I'm very thankful that on the outside they kept the wolf sign, so that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, so there's references to that. There's references to like just different innuendos around Third War, like Shape Center, Fifty mm -hmm. Center, um, Jesse Lot. I have Jesse's top lots, you know, like for the lots in the area. Mm -hmm. Jesse's like a prominent artist. Like he's he's actually a gem. He's like probably like seventy. He's like oh wow. Oh. Speaking of Jesse, he's in his he has a show inside Station Museum. It's fantastic. He makes his humongous um, found object sculptures. A lot of it's like wire, and the way he does it, it's like like the hair of a character will be blowing in the wind, but it'll be made out of like wire and and uh, like. And this is inside. And this is inside, inside a station. Inside the Station Museum. So definitely, if you're Checking out my, my Monopoly board. Definitely uh, actually walk around because it's like all kind of great murals on the outside. And when you go yeah. in, you can see like Jesse's, um, Jesse Locke's like sculptures. They're huge. Some of them are very big. Like there's a big horse he made out of like this wire. Wow. And there's like little people. And there's also this big house reconstructed inside that's another person's um, art. Uh, I think he was like a mayor of a small town in Texas and he would take pictures of everything in his area, which case in point is important. So his stuff ended up, they even reconstructed the whole house, the shotgun house in there. Oh, wow. So it's brilliant. Yeah, Station Museum, Contemporary Art, right across from Axelrad. If you go into Axelrad, walk across the street, look at my thing, yep. look at my Monopoly board. Yep. Go on inside, you know, enjoy that art. That, we got a whole lineup day. for you. Yes. Yeah, anybody, anybody, you know, you bring a date, bring your peoples, bring your family. Yeah. And you mentioned, so you mentioned the other artists' names as well, who are also featured in Station Museum. Are there any other areas, museums, wherever, you know, uh, that 
you feel like you can connect with other kind of like-minded artists and individuals, like apart from, you know, your installations and like the places that your projects are seen, are there any other areas, um, you know, of interest for you that you kind of go and meet like-minded people, like-minded artists and just kick it and connect? You kind of have to be in, like, follow certain people and follow certain groups to kind of put on events. Like, um, what's the guy named Troy? He was like a photographer. He has a beard. I don't know what nationality is because he, he's like, like racially ambiguous. <laughs> but he has like really dope photography. And he just did an event at this place called Proper House. And they do a lot of really cool stuff. Okay. A lot of artists show up to them. Actually, you, yeah, you I've heard that big story. You would, huh? I said I've heard of proper before. Yeah, you need to be in that mix. I think you would find like a lot of you find a good tribe in that. Um, a little so, tribe, a little crew. Yeah, I love so that. Definitely, um, those guys do cool stuff, and I like Greg Noir. Like whenever he does an event, he's like take he, he's a photographer. He take pictures like um, concerts and stuff. Like I forget what that's called, concert photography. I guess I just call it that. <laughs> And then, you know, whenever, actually the art shows, like, you know, Robert Hodge, when he does stuff, you know, he did that um, Collect for the Culture thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, C4, C3 was cool. Yeah, I'm still salty about not being included in that, but, you know, whatever. You know, we, we, <laughs> could, we get over when we feel like getting over it, you know, but hey. <laughs> Listen, yeah. you heard it here first. Yeah. C4, C3, if you're, if you're listening to this. <laughs> yeah, definitely follow that, so whatever you do, another way. <laughs> You know, what's actually really funny is I was, this is my very first time being involved in any type of visual art medium in any way, shape or form, but uh, Collective for the Culture was actually the first time I was on, like, as a, I was a muse for a mural. Oh, wow. um, it was right on top of the the old Forever 21, um, which was kind of cool, so. Yeah. Um, this is great. I think you need to get into that, like, this go all in with the creativity because I think you have all the tools in you you know you just oh thank you I love I I love creativity in a weird way I love talking to people who are more creative than me like yourself I love How talking you know to people you. <laughs> it makes you think of more creative than you it's all about perception you know it you is know? everyone can be creative um yeah. But I love being, I love being no, nosy and creative. I love getting to know about people and their stories and their background and where they come from and how like all of that is interconnected with creativity and just like human connection and as a whole. So I love getting to know people like you. Um, I do want to know though, we talked about a lot of uh, gentrification and a lot of stealing, which I hate. Um, side eye um but i do want to know like what is your hope for the future of third ward for preservation i want to know like what mark you want to leave behind um as well especially within your neighborhood and within your community well i definitely enjoy like public art like i love you know, things that draw people to where they want to <clears throat> interact with things that I do. Yeah. So that always brings me joy. Uh, and also, you know, just like what I said earlier, I want to advocate for people that record their own people, you know, record their own yeah. environments. So that's going to be a thing. I'm going to make manifest that. Oh, I also want to talk about like other people that influence me. Cause I, saw, I see somebody, I hope she's still on, but Carla Sue is on. <gasps> Carla Sue. Yeah. Shout out to She's one of the people that inspired me when I was doing um, the whole pop-up thing. Like it was mm -hmm. her and the other lady, um, Zynga, who did uh, Inclusive Randomness, the buttons. She does like, these really just dope buttons. Mm -hmm. Both of these two ladies are brilliant. And how I even started getting really good with my presentation was eyeballing what they were doing. And they would give me advice or whatever. And... <clears throat> Cause like when I first started with the t-shirts and the pop-ups, it was like just chaos. Like I didn't, you know, like cardboard boxes everywhere and 
pulling yeah. shirts out and it was like the chaos. Looking at the size, trying to figure out if they got the right yeah. size. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So over time, I developed a very um, organized system and my presentation got really crisp and I just kind of like ordered shelving from Amazon and wheel carts and I could set up really quick and I could pack my stuff up really well and I color coordinated everything. Yes, we love organization. I learned all that from uh, Carlos Sue and, and Yingen, like a inclusive randomness, like, and, you know, a couple of other people too. But that's who I really drew from the most. And I kind of missed those days because it's like we had like a little collective going, you know. Yeah. That was pretty nice. You know, sisters really, you know, coming through for the brother, you know. Yes. We love um, it. So that, I don't know if I want to be t-shirt. I mean, it's like, I, I feel like I should get back into that, but I don't know if I can handle pop-ups. It's like the brutal heat. I, I think I've gotten soft. <laughs> it's like one time it was like 80 degrees. It was like, oh man, I, I just, I can't. <laughs> It humbles you, but if you've already been humbled, then maybe you don't need to be humbled again. I just uh, it, like <laughs> Carl Sue and um, Benzinga, inclusive randomness, they like straight up, they're so gangster now. They don't even do, they don't even like go out in public no more. It's just like straight up, you know, like, don't <laughs> like Carl Sue's, her stuff is in stores. <laughs> oh. You know, and um, inclusive randomness, this like all online and it's still popular, yeah. you know, so I was like, you know, I can do that. I'm gonna go back into that game. I might. I might be asking y'all for advice. (laughs) We got you. We got you. Um, Is there anybody else you want to shout out? Any organizations or like people who've been down since day one? Like anyone who has helped you, you know, whether it be uh, with your artistry or whether it be personal life stuff or any people or organizations that we should be uh tapping into community artist collective definitely like um, michelle barnes the founder of that she helped she gave my first photography show way back and um you know i had a show during photo fest during the pandemic but you know, oh yeah they got canceled real quick because of the because of the pandemic and <laughs> so now we're talking about we're going to be doing another show in the fall a two-month show and details will come forthcoming. It won't be just me. I want it to be like a group show. And I want to bring people that don't necessarily participate in, that are great artists, but haven't really been included in the whole museum and gallery thing. So I want to, um, I want that to kind of manifest. We're still talking about how it's going to be and that sort of thing. But I definitely want to manifest. Also, my friend uh, Mark Francis and uh, Brian Ellison, really nice guys. The art is great. And um, they really helped me, you know, like Brian actually encouraged me to pursue an MFA at a U of H, which I applied and I, I got in. And hey, congratulations. Really so I'm going to be, I'm gonna be doing that. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so it's just, I think the future is going to be really bright. And the program that I got into, <clears throat> will allow me to, you know, blend technology with my art because mm-hmm. the next wave for me is I want to get into augmented reality, like actually have a, um, some animation going with the Monopoly board and that's going to go, that's going to go pretty good. It's going to go pretty hard. And I'm just waiting for the company that I partner with, you know, to finish up and then I'm going to release that to the public. That sounds awesome. Please, please let us know at Black Sheep and of course me. And we will. Um, when all of this is happening, we would love to support you and we want everyone to support you in the Houston community and beyond because the work that you're doing is absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Um, it keeps, me, uh, it keeps me going. I just want to get, I want to get up and create. Right now. I mean, I don't want to get up. I just want to create today. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Where, okay, so for everybody who doesn't know, we actually wrote a blog on Mark a couple of months ago. Um, that you can find on our website, theblacksheepagency.com. And Mark, where else can we go to support you? Give us your your handles. Give us your social media. Give us your website. Give us all the things, locations. Give us dates, whatever you want. <laughs> cool, awesome. So <clears throat> my social media handles are Mark Fury, M-A-R-C-F-U-R-I. And I love Third Ward. That's I L O V E, 
three R D W A R D. That's Instagram. And there's also the other one is Extraordinary Elders. If you want to like check out the videos that um, we did, me and Lucy worked on um, recording elders. And what else? Oh, um, you know, of course my my uh, art installation at Station Museum. That's across yes. from Axelrod. Yes. It's on Alabama. I don't know what the side street is, but you just drive down Alabama. I come from Breakfast Club, and you'll see it on the, on the right. Uh, what else? So I got a couple of murals that I've worked. I mean, a couple of um, light boxes that I worked on with uh, Israel McLeod, and those are at <clears throat> the corner of Elgin and Emancipation, right on the corner of where Emancipation Park is, and the second one is farther up. It's uh, at Cleburne in Emancipation. And one is like this kind of like the spirit of Third War with this kind of like these African motifs. And the other one is based on the music resonating from Third War, like the, the um, PSC band, the Ocean of Soul, kind of like a ode to uh, Arnett Cobb, you know, prominent saxophonist musician. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, Lightning Hopkins. And that's, um, you know, just check them out. What else? I got all kind of stuff and I'm gonna- he, he got a whole bunch of different kind of stuff. If y'all run into it, it, take a picture with it, tag him in it so he can repost it. <laughs> you know, I'm probably gonna be starting up the, um, the I Love Their Award videos in front of the Station Museum again. Like, the, well, in the past it was like in front of the I Love Their Award house when I had that. So I kind of want to resuscitate that and make these little short videos about you know, people, you know, explaining what they love about their award. Really simple, gentle. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much, Mark. It has Thank been you. a complete pleasure talking with you. Thank you for answering my plethora of questions. Um, I am so honored to know you, and I'm so happy to be your friend. And hey, this is, this is I... Yes, it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, you are not only your own hype man, but you are also a hype man to me too. Um, so I appreciate that and thank you so much. Um, I will put all of your links and your handles and everything in the description of this video um, once we're off, but thank you so much. And I cannot wait to chat with you again and to see what is in your future. This sounds wonderful. I've Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Take care. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.